who wants to think about this subject when you're healthy and independent and feeling good, right? Nobody does. In fact, all of us hope we never need care, right? Or, or, or if we do, it's for a very short period of time at the very end of life. Um, but the reality is many of us, especially as we're successful living a long time into our 80s and 90s, which is common today and what we're all planning for, you know, with our retirement years, um, it's reasonable to expect we could need care for a few years along the way. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't think about it till their health changes or they get a diagnosis of something and I get the call and I say, unfortunately, you know, that's a, a condition or a circumstance that's just not insurable. Hey, y'all, this is Costa. And today I'm here with my guest, Bill Comfort, long-term care specialist, owner of Comfort Long-Term Care, founder and chief author of the Long-Term Care Claims Professional Designation and Training Program, and finally, host of um, Aging America Radio. Featured everywhere from Fox News, The Wall Street Journal, and Smart Money, for the past 30 years, Bill has dedicated his work to bringing awareness and clarity to the issues of long-term care, and more importantly, how to prepare. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. It's truly an honor, and as we know, this might be one of the most important questions surrounding care today. So let's start with the basics and the title of the show. How will the average American pay for long-term care, and how do you rank those options? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, uh, Costa, and thanks for the opportunity to be with you. Absolutely. Um, most Americans... 80% of people who need care are cared for informally by family or friends, mm -hmm. uh, a spouse, a partner, an adult child, some other loved one or someone close to them. Um, and at, at first blush, that might seem to be free. There's potentially or commonly no out-of-pocket cost to pay for your loved ones, your family members to take care of you. But it does come with a cost. It comes with a cost of uh, changes in a relationship between a, a caregiving child uh, and their parent, uh, lifestyle changes, physical, emotional, mental stress and health issues for the caregiver. So family care is part of the process, is part of caregiving, but if it's only that type of informal care, there's a very, very high personal cost to it. Uh, it's interesting, I was just having a discussion earlier today that even with other plans, even with good finances, a lot of savings or long-term care insurance, which are other options as well, um, family members will still provide care. And this idea of planning for care, which I know you want to talk about as well, sure. is to really find a balance between <clears throat> all of those things. But the number one way care is received is personally from, again, family, friends, loved ones. Um, probably secondly, um, in, in terms of professional care, paid for care, mm -hmm. Medicaid, which is our, you know, uh, financial support system for medical care. Um, Medicaid is the largest payer of long-term care services for people who need, like, help safely bathing and dressing or because of something like Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, Medicaid's the number one payer. Problem with Medicaid is you essentially have to be impoverished financially to qualify. To qualify. Absolutely. And that leaves us with paying out of pocket or buying insurance if you plan ahead. Um, most people don't plan to go on Medicaid, particularly if they have some savings, some means, some income, but they find that they're stuck with that because it's the only choice because they failed to plan or over relying, I guess we might say, on family members if you fail to plan ahead. Well, and I think once you have to accept Medicaid, you kind of lose control of all of the kind of um, 
individual kind of independence, uh, control of the care process, because you're having to rely on providers that are within the Medicaid network. Uh, and I know that a lot of states try to uh, bring choice back into the Medicaid uh, system, but it's still really hard, you know. And 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 it. I mean, first you lose control of a lot of your finances mm -hmm. because Good of point. the financial minimum levels of of assets that you can't have um, in order to qualify. And and there's nothing wrong with Medicaid. It's a it's a terrific safety net. Um, the problem is, like you said, you, you, you lose control. For, for many years, and still in many states, Medicaid primarily means care in a nursing home, mm -hmm. the last place most people ever want to plan to go. And even in states where there are some good home or community care benefits, uh, they tend to be, to be limited limited in scope or limited in access. So this idea of control, if I need care, this would be a planning ahead question. Where would I wanna get care for myself, for my spouse, or you know, for me and my family? Um, that's a critical question to ask ahead of time, because you're right, if you end up on Medicaid, you're stuck with what the state's providing based on you know, how much money you have. Absolutely. And so let's say you don't qualify for Medicaid and you didn't get a long-term care policy. Let's say you're having to pay for it out of pocket. Realistically, yeah. what should the average individual prepare or save for their long-term care needs? And is there a way to foresee these expenses and costs? Well, I, I think you have to foresee these expenses and costs mm -hmm. because they're not covered by anything else. They're not covered by health insurance. They're not covered by Medicare. Even if you have the best Medicare supplement in the country, long-term custodial care, day-to-day -day care with your safety, physically or mentally, cognitively getting through the day, Medicare doesn't pay for those things. So you do have to plan ahead. Now, what does it cost? It, and how much should somebody save? Let's look at that in two parts because there's sure. a day-to-day -day or monthly cost of care to pay privately, again, for these services that we, we call uh, personal care or custodial care, helping somebody be safe uh, physically or because of a cognitive mental limitation, mm -hmm. you know, Alzheimer's or dementia, as I've mentioned. Um, and depending on where you get the care and the degree of care you need sort of determines that monthly cost. And I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment. But the issue of savings is how long might the need for care last? Well, you know, I mean, on is average. Care for, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, on average, how often do they need long-term care? Yeah. Um, so it's a little tricky. Um, so averages, right? Mm -hmm. Average all the needs for care. And men, average length of care, once somebody needs what would be considered significant levels of care. Mm -hmm. So help with at least two of these physical activities, things like bathing, dressing, eating, transferring in and out of bed or a chair. Mm -hmm. So needing help with two of those activities, at least having someone around so you're safe, or supervision for things like cognitive impairments, Alzheimer's, sure. dementia, stroke. Um, men on average need care about two and a half years. Women need care on average three and a half to four years. Wow. But here's an interesting data point to keep in mind. That's the average. And half of the people who need this kind of care need it for less than a year. Interesting. So that really brings the average down. Mm -hmm. So if we look, and, and I'm using here long-term care insurance claims data. So it's very, um, the information is consistent, whether it's a short claim or a long claim, the type of care that's needed. Um, because 
well, and again, long-term care insurance kicks in when you need help with two of the activities or cognitive supervision. Um, once someone needs care for at least one year, the average jumps to about four years for men and five years or a little longer for women. So wow. what I tell folks is you should plan for, men should plan for two and a half to four years of care. Women should plan for three and a half to five or six years of care. And here's the thing, we, we don't know. It's, it's one of those things we can't know, so we need to plan for as, as much as we can financially and, and practically, which brings us back to the cost of care. Sure. So uh, 40 hours a week. Home care today costs anywhere from about $25 an hour to $30 an hour, mm -hmm. depending on where you are in the country. So 40 hours a week of professional home care, which is really part time, you know, that would be right. Monday through Friday, you know, eight to five. So your adult daughter can continue her job and go to work or 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 a, a mix of things throughout the week to give a caregiver a break. 40 hours of home care is now five thousand dollars a month or more. And most people can't afford that. It, because it's extra, especially think right. about this for couples. Mm -hmm. If if one spouse needs care and you're bringing in 30 or 40 hours a week of professional care, maybe just to give that other spouse a break from caregiving to get a good night's sleep or go shopping or do things with his or her friends without worrying, 40 hours a week, that 5,000 a month, that's extra. Yeah, that's on top of all of the life and, and living expenses that have to continue for both of them. Imagine that caregiver, they work a full time job, then they come home and they work a full time job. And then the significant other who supports in terms of respite care to give that other person a break also works a full time job. It's just there's so much involved in the care process. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, please no. continue. You're, 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 you're exactly right. And one of the things that I like to say is, and, and, and I, I primarily make my living selling long-term care insurance, as sure. you noted in the introduction. I'm a broker, I'm independent, I'm not beholden to any one company or type of insurance for that. But one of the things that, that's critical to understand Long-term care insurance is not really for the person who needs care. Mm -hmm. So yeah, long-term care insurance, if you need care cost, a long-term care insurance policy, it will pay for your care. But who does it protect? It right. protects everyone else in your life who loves you and and would have no choice but to put their lives aside to make sure you're safe and to take care of you. So th that's back to where we started, that it works. Long-term care insurance doesn't completely remove family involvement, but it lets you determine what family members, loved ones will do or won't do, time or tasks along the way. And so on that note, I mean, what age range is optimal to start creating a strategy for long-term care, and what do you think should be the top priorities? Yeah, um, I, I, the, the sort of, the, the basic guideline is you really need to be considering the subject by about age 50. Okay. 55 for sure. Um, you know, the, the most buyers of long-term care insurance fall between 55 and 65 years old. Um, so if you're 62 and you haven't done anything about it yet, well, now's the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I work with people in their late 60s, early 70s. The concern at that age, A, the insurance obviously becomes much more expensive than if you bought it sooner. It still can be a good value, but the other issue is health. You have to health qualify. So In other words, you have to be healthy enough mm -hmm. to buy the insurance. Yeah. Right, right. 
So I, I really, in your 50s, early 60s, is when you need to be looking at the subject of planning for care and considering if long-term care insurance is needed and how, to what degree, what amount should be used to fit in with your other financial plans. When they buy long-term care insurance, is it like a term? Like, do they buy 10 years worth of coverage? So if you buy it at 55, does it cover you to 65? Or does it, you know, is it like 20 years or like till end of life? Kind of like life insurance. And and there's one, yeah. uh, one other question that I'd like. Have you ever encountered people that maybe are suffering from a chronic illness and... They come to you and they say, hey, um, I, I need to buy lo a long-term care insurance. And you have to kind of say, well, listen, you know, you're, you're kind of uninsurable. It's like crashing the car and then trying to get auto insurance. And I know it sounds opaque talking about people instead of vehicles. Right. But it's kind of the reality. Yeah, it's – it, that that actually happens often. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's, it's one of the harder uh, aspects of my job. Um, most, it, look, listen, who, who wants to think about this subject when you're healthy and independent and feeling good, right? Mm -hmm. no, nobody does. In, in fact, all of us hope we never need care. Right? Or, or, or if we do, it's for a very short period of time at the very end of life. Um, but the reality is many of us, especially as we're successful living a long time into our 80s and 90s, which is common today and what we're all planning for you know, with our retirement years, um, it's reasonable to expect we could need care for a few years along the way. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't think about it till their health changes or they get a diagnosis of something and I get the call and I say, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, a condition or a circumstance that's just not insurable. Um, again, why you need to plan ahead versus just be in a reacting kind of a mode. Your, your first question, when you buy long-term care insurance, and, and there's lots of different types of, of policies now, but when you buy it, the, the expectation is you buy it and it covers you as long as you live. So there's not a, there's not a term to the coverage, mm -hmm. owning the coverage. So if you buy it at 55 and you don't need care till 87, as long as you've paid up your policy or you've been paying premiums along the way, that money, that insurance money is going to be there. What gets confusing sometimes is one of the variables in designing your policy. Back okay. to our, our discussion a couple minutes ago. You choose how much per month mm -hmm. the policy could make available. Three, four, five thousand dollars. There's that's flexible. And the other important variable is how long will the policy pay out once you need care? Right. So a five-year policy, if you buy it at age 55, you don't, it, 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 it lasts until you're 85. The five years is just is how long the money would pay out once you would go on claim at some time in the future. So... The premium doesn't change for that 30 years that you're paying, right? You're still paying the same so, amount of premium? It, it, that's, a, that's a really, it's a good question. It's an important question to understand. There are policies that have guaranteed premiums today. Mm -hmm. um, they're more expensive okay. than those that don't have guaranteed premiums. Most long-term care insurance, at least historically, um, the way that it's priced is the premiums are designed to stay level, okay? but they're not guaranteed to stay level. So, it, for example, the insurance company cannot raise your premiums just based on age or changes in health, or if you have a short claim and you come off a claim and so on. They can only raise the rates if they realize that they have mispriced mm -hmm. the, the premiums for everybody 
yeah. in uh, the pool. Um, and that's happened in the past. The good news is the pricing's much more conservative, much more stable, we think, looking forward today on those policies that yeah. could be increased. Again, if somebody's deeply concerned about that, we do have plans where you can guarantee the guarantee, premium now. Yeah. And so I am curious, like, what about inflation? Um, like, say, for example, you know, uh, you know, you said that the typical hourly wage for a caregiver uh, is somewhere between 25 and $30 an hour. And just being in the industry, I know that that number was closer to 16 and $25 an hour, you know, 10 years ago. So, right. you know, if a long-term care policy pays a daily, pre uh, daily benefit, um, are there, are there things or riders or something that you can purchase in a policy, uh, that will compensate for, uh, rising prices? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's critically important because again, you have to buy this coverage when you're independent and healthy and most people are in their fifties or early sixties. So they're not going to use this coverage for at least 20 years right. in most cases. And like everything else, the cost of care is going up, will continue to. In fact, you know, we got the baby boomers pushing into their mid 60s yep. and they haven't even started using care yet, whether it's right. home care or assisted living or memory care. So the, the supply and demand is already a little out of whack and it's only going to get worse, which is only going to drive prices up naturally. That's Econ 101. Yeah. Um, so you can buy, and you use the right term, a rider. So let's say you choose to start with a benefit that's 4000 a month mm -hmm. and payable for four years. You can add a rider that will automatically grow that $4,000 a month benefit at a set interest percentage. And you can choose anywhere from 1% to 5%. Obviously, the higher growth rate has a higher premium, mm -hmm. so you can you can build that in, and we recommend that um, for most people. Uh, I've had some clients; it's an interesting approach. But let's say, based on the cost of care today, they would need four thousand dollars a month if they needed care today. But we think that the cost of care could double in twenty years. So you could put a three or four percent inflation rider on it. I've had some clients they buy eight thousand today, but it stays level. Interesting. So they're sort of buying more today to be ahead later. Mm -hmm. If something catastrophic happens sooner, well, they're that much better off sooner. So there's a lot of different ways to design coverage, and there's no perfect way. The best way is what's right for each individual client. Absolutely. And so a brief answer, uh, nothing too elaborate because it'll make okay. us go down a rabbit hole, but what happens if nobody plans? Like what happens if no one buys insurance and no one saves for, I mean, so many people don't save for retirement as is. I mean, is Medicaid the only option? Like, is that just kind of the catch-all for everybody who didn't plan? Well, I would say the first thing that happens and we're already seeing it you, the burden falls to your loved ones to yeah. your family yeah uh, or to other people could be friends neighbors folks in your church or temple or uh, whatever who who have to make sure you're okay sure and 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 that's again there's there's a big personal price that gets paid by the caregivers um it, and then, yeah, Medicaid is the is the backstop, and it's it's growing. The cost of Medicaid's already growing so fast, so and fast. we haven't even seen the boomers begin to enter caregiving years. You know, if if I if I may speak briefly on the on the uh, baby boomer generation, so there's an eighty percent. The statistic says there's an eighty percent chance that somebody over the age of seventy five as they get to end of life, will access the long-term care market. They will need some form of long-term care for however long it may be. So baby boomers are born between 1946 and 1964. The first baby boomer turned 75 years old in 2021. 
-hmm. And it is astounding to me that more people aren't talking about long-term care insurance and also all the families that are going to have to provide care and aren't going to be able to be in the workforce because there are no adult daycares to scale as there are, you know, child care uh, centers and things like that. So I guess just off the top of my head, something that pops into my mind, can we reduce the cost of care? I mean, do we have any options? We can. I think there's things that families or individuals can do in terms of what they spend. But again, if they need care, if they need supervision, it's going to fall to somebody. Yeah. Um, I think as a society, if we can find more, less institutional settings, right. if somebody doesn't need a skilled, licensed nursing home, can we deliver that in you know a less acute kind of a setting, less institutional type of a setting? I think that'll help. The problem is the volume. Yeah. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the macro cost to our country, our communities, I don't think we have any escape from. I think individually, mm-hmm. we all need to take responsibility and do planning for ourselves and for our families because that's what we can control. Um, well, I, I think, you know, there's already some states that are doing some tax-based uh, additional long-term care plans. Washington State's got one. But that's going to provide one year of benefits at three thousand a month, right? And that's just not that, enough. It, it's not. Yeah. It, it it it's not. Now, what it might do is it might keep you know that half of those people only need care for a year, might keep them off of Medicaid, might help someone stay at home for a year before they might have to transition into a Medicaid setting, um, and. Those kind of savings, you know, to taxpayers, to government, I, I think could help, but it's not the big solution. Um, well, if I can infer what I believe could be, and and I know that you're probably going to say, yeah, I know, but we're a little bit, uh, we're not there yet. You know, we're nowhere close. Um, I do think that technological applications to removing the human element for care, because paying, like you, like we were talking about earlier, paying a human being to care for another human being is extremely expensive. And if you're not willing to pay for it in, in money, you're going to pay for it in time. So if you didn't invest, um, not just for retirement, but for long-term care insurance, uh, you're going to have a very hard time uh, enjoying uh, the last, you know, 20, 25 years of your life and and have a high quality of living uh, because you're going to be caring for a loved one or you yourself may need long-term care. So I think that, and, and when I say technological applications, I'm not, you know, this isn't the Jetsons. You know, we're not, right. I'm not the robot. Yeah, right. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying something simple, um, as like remote supports, um, where you can have, uh, kind of a, a visual tool, uh, to ensure that somebody is safe. Geolocation is great for Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and, and really it, it goes back to exactly what you were saying about, about making the plan, um, about, when the family will be involved, when they won't be, and breaking literally a day down to 24 hours and saying, okay, we can use this application to cover one hour, and we can use this application to cover another hour. Right. So, And, and there will be, you know, we think about robotic care, and, right. and the Jetsons is sort of the, the far edge of fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and on the other hand, we're seeing these little roll around robots that are being experimented with that just feels creepy. Sure. But you know, 20 years from now, what was this 20 years ago? Yeah. yeah. It was a flip phone that you made phone calls right. on. And now it's a supercomputer. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I think that has that holds a lot of promise. But here's the thing: none of these are the answer. Correct. I think a combination of all of these things will become the answer: technology, some robotic, uh, 
the human caregiving is always going to be an aspect. And I'll tell you, we need to care, uh, pay these frontline caregivers even more today. Absolutely. Than they're getting. And, Absolutely. and of course, that's, it, that's inflationary itself. And it's the same with planning. A big mistake, Costa, that I see a lot of people make is they say, well, you know, 40 or 50 hours of home care could be five or 6,000 a month. Assisted living or memory care could be seven to 9,000 a month. And a nursing home, you know, could be 12,000 sure. a month. And then they try to buy long-term care insurance for nine or 10 or $12,000 a month of benefits. Yeah, that's unaffordable. Right. But even three or 4,000 a month, mm -hmm that could help provide that part-time professional home care without breaking the bank, without destroying financial security, and giving the respite, giving the break to the spouse, the partner, the kids, that will help most people through the most common, let's call it two to four year care scenario. Sure. It's a good worst point. case, worst case, there's Medicaid or, you know, other financial means that somebody might have. I want to talk about the difference between retirement and, and long term care um, planning. How does retirement and investment planning differentiate from long term care planning? I, I think they're they're integral. I, I don't think they're separate subjects, okay. and I don't think they should be looked at separately. A good retirement plan, let, let's call it a retirement income plan. Mm -hmm. What will I live on in retirement? What will I live on when I choose to stop or have to stop earning a paycheck? Um, that, you know, the whole premise of retirement planning today is based on this reasonable assumption that we could live to 85, 90, if not longer, and right. we need to be able to pay for life. Yeah. And if we live that long, I, I think I, I said this a little earlier, it's kind of reasonable that if I'm going to make it to 85, if not longer, it's reasonable to think I could need some care along the way. So long-term care planning is a longevity planning issue the same way that retirement planning is a longevity driven issue. Um, and and, and the, it needs to work together. It, let me come back to couples. Mm -hmm. if, if one spouse needs care at 77 for two or three years and then passes away, mm -hmm. Let's say it's the guy. I mean, it's not always the case, but men tend to die before women, typically, on, you know, big picture. His partner, his wife, needs to be able to continue to live. You can't spend unlimited money on that first person to need care because you got to protect the rest of the retirement savings. You're, you're absolutely And long-term right. care planning's, again, part of that. And so do you see in your industry that a lot of people reach out to you and say, hey, we're planning for retirement. We need a long-term care policy. Is that the conversation that you're starting to see now? Or have you been seeing it for years and you're confident that we are at the point where long-term care becomes a staple like car insurance? Yeah, we're, we're not there. Okay, we're not it's, there. It's getting, it's getting better. Okay. And, and here's – see uh, – I'm, I specialize in long-term care insurance, so mm -hmm. I network with you know care providers, uh, CPAs, financial planners, estate planning attorneys, right. and part of my job is helping them to know how to raise the subject with their clients, connected to the other planning they're doing, and those are good referrals to my business. Um, and that's beginning to change. We're beginning to see these advisory professionals really begin to bring this subject up and say, hey, this has to be part of the retirement planning. Good. And I kind of come in in the relationship as a specialist that's in that great. way. Um, but still, we only have like 10, 12% market penetration with long-term care insurance. 
I mean, and 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 this is sort of looking at age, you know, forty five plus. So kind of the demographic that should be buying it or should own it. Mm -hmm. And there are estimates that forty to fifty percent of Americans should buy it financially and can afford some meaningful amount and can still qualify medically. Half the folks are going to have medical issues they can't qualify, or they have such low income and assets already, they're the ones Medicaid was really designed to protect from sure. the beginning. Sure. So we got a long way to go. It's getting better, but man, we're not there yet. Who, who wants to think about it, Costa? Well, that's I mean, really the biggest barrier, you know. And so, developing developing this podcast and talking about long term care, and prior to this, you know, we had a long term care channel where we did videos to bring awareness. <clears throat> and one of the most difficult things is you find people looking at long term care. You see it from an insurance aspect. I see it from a service provision, um, and then I saw it on the YouTube channel. People look for long-term care when they need it. And if they look right. for it when they need it, then it's already too late. Right. Yeah. It, it, the options are limited, as you mentioned right. earlier, and the insurance is then really off yeah. the table uh, as, as, a, as a source of funds uh, to pay for care. Yeah. So, and, and that's driven, uh, unfortunately, now, mm -hmm. certainly if there are folks in their 50s where they're taking care of their parents, and they're seeing what's going on, that's a highly motivated person. And that's a, you know, that's a good, uh, it, it's an unfortunate motivator, but we have to start looking at this as, as a planning necessity, not just waiting for a crisis. Cause again, like you said so well, the, the options are gone at I, that point. I think we're already in a crisis to be quite honest with you, you know? As so, a country, we are. Yeah. But but that's, again, back to this idea of what can I take responsibility sure. for? Right. I could take responsibility for my life, my planning, my spouse, my family's lives and lifestyle. What can I do to protect them as I also plan to care for yeah. myself? So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What's your best advice for someone entering the long-term care industry as a patient, a caregiver, or an industry professional? Yeah, it, for somebody who is on that cusp of, of needing care and their caregiver, partner, you know, the family member, the best advice I could give to them is to find a good independent care manager, geriatric care manager, okay. or social worker maybe that's connected to, you know, a, a service provider that can really help you think about not just who's going to be here on Tuesday when I have to go to work, mm -hmm. but how can I help take care of myself? I, that's just, that's so critical if you're in the crisis. Um, by the way, if you have a family member who needs care and they have long-term care insurance, get a review of it. Find out what's in that policy that maybe somebody already has because you can save yourself a lot of agony in the claims process uh, it, with a little bit of heads up work. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I guess the other group was, you know, maybe coming into this, you know, from the financial profession. Sure. Um, this is this should be a growth area. This should be an opportunity for somebody who is interested in insurance sales or financial planning, financial advising. And and my message to other agents or advisors or folks coming in is you have to take advising authority and proactively raise the subject with your clients that you serve. Because again, if you don't, once they're in crisis, the options are very, very limited. And, and really, it's the advice to, to, to you and me as well, our peers, our sure, age yeah. groups, 
Start thinking about it when you can. It's not an easy subject. As much as I enjoy it and you enjoy the subject, right. it's not. I recognize the it's majority a of Americans subject. don't. Yeah, but it's like doing your wills and trusts and getting your power of attorney in order. You so know, necessary. It's something you have to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the good news is, if you do it well. It's not something you got to do every every year or every six right. months. You, you kind of do it once, and then you can get on with the rest of life securely. And it'll benefit you, and it'll save you so much heartache in the future. Right. So, Bill, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I wish you the best of luck, and if there's anything that we can do here, uh, please let us know. Have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.